I'm going to stick it on, stick it off my desk. There we go. Um, so I just had quite a list of topics that I thought I would go through tonight to help you with your container gardening, um, including soil and water, some of the different flowers and vegetables. Actually, I swapped those. We'll do vegetables first because it seemed like most people were curious about vegetables. Um, and then a little quick design activity at the end if we have time, hopefully. So for the overview of container gardening, we want to pick a container. I'll go through some of the options um, that you probably know a lot of these options. Let's talk about soil and amendment, um, and that's what you're going to fill your pot with. What plants should you select and why? Um, and then what can you do kind of for maintenance? Um, I think the main thing with maintenance is making observations and whatever kind of information you can get um, with like a soil mo moisture probe or um, checking daily on your pots is, is going to be helpful for you. Some of the um, advantages that I like to think of with container gardening is that you can kind of get an instant landscape. Um, it does take a little while, you know, for those plants to fill out. This looks like high summer, um, but you can really get a lot of three-dimensional um, and softening of architecture with plants in pots. Um, I think on a lot of like movie sets, you know, they'll have a lot of things in pots. They can come in, put it in, make it look like a, an existing landscape. And um, if you've been to any of the garden shows, that's kind of how they do it too. Some of the plants look a little stressed, but it's still pretty amazing how quickly people can build a landscape with containers. Um, some of the disadvantages is that, you know, the pots do need to be watered on almost a daily basis. Maybe when it's, you know, like last June was pretty wet. If you had some pots planted, you wouldn't necessarily need to be watering them every day if it's raining. But um, this is a picture of kind of a shallow pot. And so I think of shallow pots as being a little bit better for succulents or cactuses that don't maybe need as much water. Um, and then some of the challenges with hanging baskets, they can be challenging to water. So some of the things you might want to ask yourself if you are looking at um, getting more pots or even if you're reflecting on the pots that you have, um, will you need to move these? The pots can be very heavy, just the pots themselves. And so once you fill them with soil and plants, that's a pretty heavy weight. Um, do you have time? Um, to water or can you put in an irrigation system? I will talk about that. How many pots can you take care of? How big of a garden can you handle? And how much money do you want to spend on this on this endeavor? Um, you can start a lot of flowers from seed or you know herbs and vegetables from seed yourself um, and that will save you a lot of money versus if you go buy you know kind of full-grown plants, but that is a quicker satisfaction. So a container calendar, um, this is the winter time to kind of dream, plan, design in the spring. Then you can start your seeds, um, purchase containers or, or acquire containers if you're doing something creative. And then you want to plant them just like we do with our vegetable gardens, kind of plant late in the spring when we know that that last frost is over with. Um, pots are maybe a little easier to cover or bring into the garage if we are going to get a frost, so you can kind of extend the season with pots if you want to do it that way. Um, in the summer, you're just kind of maintaining, watering, fertilizing, and then in the fall, um, if you're growing annuals, you want to remove all the plant material and you can empty out the pots so they last longer or, or do other winterization activities. Um, if you're growing perennials, you're going to leave those in, obviously, um, and then if you are keeping the soil in your pots, if you don't empty them out, you might want to keep track of what plant family you grew each year so that you can rotate your plant families. And that helps with disease. Okay, so some containers. Um, you probably have observed that ceramic containers can freeze and crack. And so one of the things you can do to help with that is to seal them. There are specific um, ceramic pot sealers that you can purchase and paint on the outside and the inside, especially the terracotta pots, such as this one. If they're fired um, with a glaze, that can really help um, preserve the integrity. And then if it's not um, sealed or high fired, you can line the inside with that sealant. They come in a spray or a brush on. Um, and then uh, another tip is to um, 
purchase a caster and I mean, they make casters for this that are on a little tray. And so you can wheel those around and they lock so they don't roll if you don't want them to. Um, so the high fire ceramics are more durable for outdoors. If you're getting a low fire ceramic, um, usually the stores, that those are the pots they're selling kind of inside. They're not suitable for outdoors. Those are more for your house plants inside. Um, if you're growing food in plastic pots or like here's an example of a tire, this is a painted um, tire. Um, those can release um, chemicals back into your into your soil and possibly into your food. So that's just something to think about. Um, you can get your plant um, your plants tested at a lab to see if there are toxic chemicals um, in in the plant materials itself. And U of I Analytic Lab can do that and other labs can do that. Um, metal containers I have found can be sort of hot. Like, so maybe the growing season in June is pleasant. The roots will grow up against those metal containers. Um, like some people use horse troughs or, or things like that. And then when it heats up in July, those roots get damaged because they're up against the heat. So the hot metal. So you can line your metal containers or choose something different. Um, there are dense styrofoam containers. They look like terracotta, but they're made out of a styrofoam. And those are great for a deck or a balcony if you're worried about the weight of the pot. And I'll talk about some other strategies to make them more lighter weight. Obviously, you can do window boxes. Um, there's a line of durable fabric, um, coconut fabric and other kinds of fabric, hemp fabric pots that are um, kind of, some of them have handles or you can put them inside a decorative pot. And then all the oddball containers that people can think of that you've seen, wheelbarrows, toilets, old sinks, all that kind of thing. So this is a tire. I thought this was interesting because it's a tire that was cut open and turned inside out and um, cut with that jagged edge. So I thought that was pretty creative. Some other container ideas. Here's an old fashioned wheelbarrow. Um, that one's going to be pretty shallow, but it's so big that maybe it can hold water pretty well. Um, and then, you know, this one's a bench with some, you get getting some vertical growing there, which can be nice later in the summer when it's full. Um, for hanging baskets, you want to use um, enough plants to fill it up, but give them a little bit of room to spread out because um, they will want to, they will want to fill out. And so this is just kind of a general guide. And then, I mean, I guess with the hanging baskets, um, oops, that can also apply to, you know, your containers. When you plant them in the spring, you want to leave a little bit of room. Or you can pack them full and just fertilize a lot. <laughs> okay, so vegetables and companion planting. Um, so some of the um, best choices are the ones that um, the conservation district purchased for these kits that Jody was talking about. And so herbs are great. Um, some of the herbs are going to be perennial and some like chives or green onions or some of the other herbs are going to be um, annual. So you can kind of decide what you want there. And they are good together and you can do annuals and perennials in a little herb garden together. Um, lettuce is a good one. Um, bush beans, I think if you're gonna do runner beans, you might wanna provide some sort of trellis. You can do it up against a wall with a trellis or something like that. Um, all your deck and um, tomatoes. If you get indeterminate tomatoes, those can get pretty tall. So you're going to want a cage or something like that. Um, and then I thought if you wanted to share in the chat, Jody had you share your favorite vegetables. If you want to engage with the chat, you can pop in what you have successfully grown in pots in the past. Um, if you want to do that. And then quick um, radishes are pretty quick. Um, lettuce is pretty quick. I had a pepper plant. I bought a um, a purple cayenne pepper plant from Deep Roots Farm um, at the Tuesday Community Market a few years ago. And I brought that in for the winter and I got harvest off of it for three years until it succumbed after the third year. <laughs> so um, if you can bring your pots in, some of these will go, tomatoes will go for, you know, 18 months to two years if you care for them. Um, but if they're, they're indeterminate, you're going to have to, uh, you know, figure out how to deal with the, <laughs> they're just going to keep getting longer and longer. Okay. Um, oh, it looks like I forgot my photo on this one. But um, basically, this is a good message that your vegetables in pots require consistent fertilization and water. So because you're watering your pots, um, you know, like 
you in July or August, you might be watering your pots every day. And so that's going to leach your fertilization, um, your fertilizer out of the soil. The nutrients will be leached out of the soil, especially the nitrogen. So then you're going to want to be replacing that for fertilizer. So I do have a slide on that and we'll talk about that. Um, one of the questions earlier in the day was about potatoes and um, potatoes are kind of fun because you can grow them in, in a vertical um, in a vertical barrel. And so you just start with um, a few inches of soil in the bottom, you set your seed potatoes in there, and then you cover it up with another four to six inches of soil. As that plant grows, um, in this image you can see the potato plant, you're going to um, cover up most of the leaves, I'll get the leaves are in here, so you can cover it up to about here, and then it will keep growing, and then all of that vertical depth will grow potatoes for you. Um, once the plants flower, then you want to stop covering the, the potato plant. And then after they turn yellow in the fall, that's when you can harvest. That's general rules about all potato varieties, but there might be some short season potatoes or longer season potatoes. So study the variety, the particular variety that you're growing. Um, so in container plants, you have, um, so this is a list of, of vegetables in general for the garden. Some are light feeders, meaning they don't need a ton of nutrients to medium to heavy. And so I would say for your container gardening, if you can stay on the light feeder side, you're gonna get a little bit better uh, yield. But as you can see, there's um, tomatoes are listed as a good plant for container gardening. It just means you do need to give them a lot of nutrition as the season goes on. And I think too, like another another concept with vegetables in the containers would be that, um, you know, onions, you know, you can start your onions in January and then, you know, you're getting like one onion per plant. Whereas like with one tomato plant, you know, you could get, I don't know, eight to 10 pounds of tomatoes. So you might want to choose plants where you're going to get a more satisfying yield, you know, in that small space. Um, so the light feeder, heavy feeder concept goes along with companion planting. If you are growing a heavy feeder, such as a tomato, um, you might not want to pair it with carrots because the carrots just might not do that well. They're not going to have enough, you know, you, you're probably not going to get enough nutrition um, to grow both. But I'm sure there's exceptions to the example. Um, but in the garden, you, you can pair carrots and tomatoes, um, but they're, you know, the root zone has a lot more uh, soil nutrition that it can draw on. So um, companion planting is great because it helps confuse, you know, bad bugs. Um, and, and it just helps with other things. And then if you're, if you're trying to do some of the container pots for a visual effect and also grow vegetables, then mixing some of the plants together is really nice. This graphic is used for educational purposes and it's from the Farmer's Almanac. And so you can go to their website and they have a, a great article on companion planting. I also sent Elizabeth and Jody a link to an extension publication on companion planting. If you would like to learn more about that, that one's from West Virginia, um, West Virginia Extension. So their climate's a little different, but still those companion plants kind of go together. You know, sometimes you'll check a website and it'll say something about, you know, a warm, a warm weather crop that we just can't grow here such as sweet potatoes, but you can use sweet potatoes in containers for decorative purposes. Um, and if you do some season extension or, you know, you might, I, like I said, there's an exception to every rule, <laughs> but some people probably have successfully grown uh, sweet potatoes in our area. Okay. Um, I did want to mention um, topiary because um, I just think that's fun. And, and so um, this is a container and this one has four plants. And um, so you can see that they grew these four plants up and then were able to um, form it into an elephant plant, um, an elephant form. Um, and I did want to mention you would are good for topiary. They are used quite a bit, but they are poisonous. So just to be aware, probably most of you know that, but just in case you didn't, I wanted to let you know that. Okay.
And then let's talk about soil. Like, What are we going to put into your pots? Um, I think that the best choice would be the pre-made potting mix. And some of those pre-made potting mixes also have that slow release fertilizer, so that's super helpful. Um, I think it's great to use organic products, but um, you can get great results with miracle Grow if what you're going for is results. But um, And they do have an organic line as well now, So, but they are a bigger, you know, bigger corporation. Um, if you, um, set up your pots with, um, the idea in mind. So, okay. So this quote here, a 10 inch water flower basket should weigh no more than six to eight pounds. And that is because if you're hanging it, but also if you have a whole deck full of pots or a balcony full of pots, you do need to think about that weight. And so one of the ways, um, I'll give you a couple other methods for lightening the pot's weight, lightening the weight. Um, but water, crystal, water crystals can help with both the weight and the watering. So these are um, a polymer product that absorbs water and then lets it back out. If you think of like the baby diapers, <laughs> if you've ever seen the material that's inside a baby diaper, it's the same thing. So, um, and then you want to make sure whether it's in your potting mix or whether you add it, you want to get some slow release fertilizer pellets that are going to release some fertilizer to those plants every time you water. Um, oh, and I just, I want to say one more word about these water crystals. Um, the research has not totally been figured out as to whether these water crystals are appropriate out in the garden. And so if you are going to take your potting soil at the end of the season and put that into your compost pile, which is recommended, um, one of the recommendations I make, um, then you might not want to use those water crystals because it's just unknown how that's going to interact with your garden soil. If you have a big garden, you might not want to use it, you know, just out in, out in the landscape. Um, okay, so for lightening up the weight of the soil inside your pot, you can use perlite, vermiculite, peat moss, or a lot of people now are using coconut core, which is a, um, a neat um, environmental thing to do because you're saving it out of the waste stream. Um, peat moss and vermiculite and perlite are all being mined and, you know, it's a limited supply worldwide. So, um, so coconut core is, is a little more environmentally sensitive and that can help reduce the weight of your pots and you mix it in with the soil. Um, those, none of those components have uh, plant nutrition really. And so um, again, you're gonna just need to watch your plants and fertilize frequently, which you need to do anyways. Um, you can use manure in your pots as a soil amendment, um, but that does need to be composted. It provides some nitrogen. Um, and then I have, a, my next slide will show you, but. Some people just use only compost in their in their pots. And I guess if it has enough soil in it, then you can just put your home compost combined with soil um, into your pot. So I'll show you this next photo. So these pots here, they're kind of, they look sort of small in the photo, but if you look compared to the chair, these were huge geraniums and um, they were just grown with the soil. I'm, I'm saying soil, but it, it was just compost. The, they would mix their compost um, and it was composted enough and turned into enough soil matter that it they were able to grow just in compost. But I don't generally recommend that. Usually if you're adding compost, you want like a third compost and two thirds soil. Um, but anyway, experiment and um, and so see what see what can work for you. <laughs> okay, so um, here's a couple ideas about the space inside your pot. So. I um, was trained by a landscaper to use styrofoam peanuts to lighten the pot and use less soil, but I don't really like that because then again, you can't turn the pot upside down and put that soil back into your garden. It was full of dirty styrofoam peanuts. So I, I don't use that anymore. Pop cans could be okay. You're creating a little more space, but if you think about the pot, um, and if you put all of those lightweight materials on the bottom of the pot, the pot can be tep he top heavy and tip over. A lot of the pots are shaped, um, you know, with a narrow bottom. And so they can be a little tippy that way. So just something to think about. You could do some soil in the bottom and then some um, cans, pop cans in the middle, but it, all of that is gonna interrupt the root zone for your plant. So I really think it's best just to use all potting soil if you can. 
Um, there was a question about gravel or rocks in the bottom. And I mean, I think it's okay and it does weight down the pot, but um, as long as you don't do it too deep. And then the soil will fill in that pore space between the gravel. So it can be okay, but I have seen some pots where, um, you know, the water cannot wick back up. So if you're trying to water from a tray on the bottom, that gravel or rock can keep that from happening. So, um, so there's a trade-off there. Um, but I think it's best to use the um, potting mix. So I said 99.9% .9 potting mix and then plus a slow release fertilizer for that other 0.1%. Okay. Um, some soil amendments you can think about and experiment with. Um, wood ash can supply trace amounts of phosphorus and potassium. And so for blooming plants, um, phosphorus is good for the blooming part of things. Um, a lot of organic farmers like to use kelp meal and that provides some of those micronutrients. So that's something you can you can add some of these things. Um, I don't know what this self-watering container mix is, but I'm guessing it has some of those crystals that I was talking about in it. And I'm not advocating any product over another product. I'm just showing you some examples, okay? So you can see what you wanna buy and um, see what works for you. Um, dried raw seaweed um, provides small amounts of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium at kind of a low level, but you can use that also as a soil amendment if you want to. Um, here's another list of other soil amendments. Um, I think the Burma compost, you know, it looks like it is um, low nutrition at a 2-1-1. And um, for anybody who doesn't know what this is, the three numbers on your fertilizer bags, such as this one in the picture, up in the corner here, um, it says 463. That's nitrogen percentage, phosphorus percentage, and potassium percentage. So 4%, and then the rest is in their ingredients. Um, and so a lot of the organic products might be a little bit lower here, but they are going to be coming from a, um, a natural source. Okay, so back to the Burma compost. So this 211 looks low, but what you can do is um, it, has, it has a lot of um, beneficial bacteria in it for your plants and it can help create that, um, that the, the biology in the soil, it can mimic the natural soil. So when you get that potting mix, it's pretty much sterile. And so I really do think adding some of these other natural materials are gonna help build a good, um, a good beneficial bacteria in that soil. Um, but you do want, um, again, if you're using like a manure, you want to buy one that has been um, composted, hot composted, so you're not getting any diseases, especially if you're growing food, you definitely want to break that barrier between anything that could be in the manure, um, you know, going in with your food. And I think for organic farming, it's like, uh, 180 days or something like that from when you would put manure onto a field from when you would harvest. So you could do it like something in the fall and then by the spring it should be, everything um, should be good to use. But, um, and then another recommendation for soil amendments, if you wanna kind of jump start is just to look for something that's specific for tomatoes. Um, this one says tomato, vegetable and, and herb. And so it's kind of trying to cover all the bases, but. Sometimes, um, you know, if you're growing roses, not that I recommend growing those in a container, but you can, um, you would wanna get a rose fertilizer. And then looking for specific recommendations on the package for container gardening. A lot of these products will say how often to fertilize with container gardening. Um, I think my favorite, I guess I'm gonna say my favorite soil amendment is fish fertilizer uh, because you can, put it on pretty frequently. It doesn't burn the plants. The only thing is it usually does have that kind of fishy smell, but that goes away. But if you're using it like, you know, two times a week, two or three times a week in a container, yeah, it could smell. <laughs> so that's just one of those drawbacks. Um, okay, yeah, so here's the recommendation about, and I wasn't necessarily recommending a brand here, but that's just how I, I think of it as Alaska fish fertilizer, but there's more than one brand. Um, and then you can get organic slow release fertilizer pellets. There's also um, synthetic um, slow release fertilizer pellets. So you can buy what more works for you. Um, and then, yeah, always read the label. It's really interesting because every product will have different, um, different instructions. And, you know, from pesticide 
safety, they always talk about follow the label, but, but that goes along with any of these um, any of these products. These companies have spent a lot of time figuring out how their product works. And so if you can follow the label, you will get better results. Um, a couple cautions about over fertilizing. Your plants can grow too quickly and become root bound um, or, or leggy. I think we've all seen that when we start our starts too early in the winter, you know, our plants can get kind of leggy before they can get out and get enough light. Um, but that can also be caused by um, too much fertilizer. One study that I read about um, flower basket, um, flower container, um, a flower container experiment. They had fertilized, they had started fertilizing in um, February, you know, because the flower baskets get started in the winter so that we can have beautiful flower baskets early um, in the summer or late spring. And so um, they had done a fertilizer regime where their pots got too big to ship. The hanging baskets got too big to ship because they over fertilized. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, okay, oops. Let's go back there. So um, this was that concept of um, emptying your pots into your compost pile, stirring that up, and then you can draw on that compost pile. This isn't a really good, I thought this was a pretty compost pile, but not a really good visual for that concept of all of the compost, you know, working its way down. Um, if you find that you don't have a lot of worms in your garden, you can augment your cold compost pile with some worms. So they'll be doing some of that work for you. Um, and then if you can dig down into the middle of that pile where it looks like soil, that um, is that material that you could fill your pot with. You obviously don't wanna be putting um, this kind of um, rough compost material into your pot because that's gonna take a lot of nitrogen for that compost to break down. So you want that, the stuff that looks like soil. Okay. And then um, Elizabeth, I'm just gonna pause here for a moment and see if there's any questions or if you want me just to address questions at the end. I do have a Q and a slide. Um, yeah, Iris, we do have a few questions. Um, we can wait to the end, um, but if it, we could ask a few here, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, I guess, yeah, can alfalfa pellets work like water crystals was one of the questions that came in that is, is relevant that you just received. Yeah, that's really interesting. I haven't heard of that, but it, it kind of, it could make sense. Um, yeah, I like that idea, but yeah, I haven't seen any studies or anything like that, but um, I would think that they would expand. They might also um, provide some nitrogen, but they also might take some nitrogen because they're going to start trying to break down. But yeah, that's an interesting idea. Um, I think that um, I see a couple questions about fish fertilizer and um, cats and yeah. then dogs and bone meal. And yeah, I do think that... Um, animals can be attracted to those. And so you do have to, if you find that you have cats or dogs coming in and messing up your pots or your garden, you can do, there are some strategies to deal with those. Um, and, uh, you know, cayenne pepper um, and cayenne pepper spray, there's commercial products that have those things in them to discourage that. Um, early in the season, if you can put some, you know, chicken wire over, um, if the the plants are just seeds still or seedlings. You can kind of lay some some wire to discourage um, the cats and dogs until your plants get a little bit bigger. But yeah, so um, soil for growing herbs indoors. I would say that would be um, the same strategy as the regular container gardening. Yeah, because you're putting them into a limited space, a limited root zone. And so you're going to want to fertilize um, as you see that they need it. I mean, I think ob observing is good um, to see how your plants are doing. If they start to, um, you know, get yellow, you might be overwatering just like with house plants, or, you know, they might be missing a nutrient. So you're just going to make some observations. If you see a problem, then you can try to identify um, what that problem, what the source of the problem is. Okay. And then, Iris, there was an earlier question in there, too, about um, how tall of a barrel for potatoes. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can use uh, like a garbage can size um, oak barrel, you know, like from a, a wine operation. That's that's a good height, but it it, uh, it would relate to um, a little bit the variety of potato. So 
um, you know, how, how deep, um, <laughs> let's see, how long are you going to be able to grow? Like what is your, how long is your growing season and how long, uh, um, until harvest does that potato want to, want to get to, but yeah, I have seen people do that in pretty deep, um, deep barrels. Yeah. Nice. Cool. Well, I think those are, yeah, kind of things that have come through the chat right now. So okay. taking the time. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought that might mix it up. For me. Yeah, that's great. Um, so you want to keep um, baskets and containers moist and you don't want them to dry out um, because um, with, with soil in the garden, the water can um, move around with pore space action. But when you're limited in a container, um, you don't have that luxury. And so you just want to make sure that you keep them you keep them moist. Um, I have a slide on drip system. So I think that's a, always a good strategy is to install a drip system so you can control how much water they're getting. Um, you guys have probably noticed this when it's um, over 90, you might have to water in the morning and in the evening to keep your pots from drying out. Um, I recommend any device that you can use or a, a tray. Um, I think it's called a self-watering container, and that would be that tray underneath where um, if you have soil all the way to the bottom in your container, the pore action of the soil will pull that water back up. And you guys have all seen this in your houseplants and, and um, any tray that you've put under a container will pull that moisture back up. It, some of it might evapo evaporate, but some of it's going to get pulled back up. So that's nice. Um, and that will give you a little bit of resilience. <laughs> Um, you know, on those dry days, if you can put a tray. Um, there was a question about water logging, and I, I do think you can over water container pots. And so that's where that observation um, can help you. Um, all of the hardware stores have soil moisture meters. And so those can help you because you can put that probe down a little further than you can put your finger in, and it can show you what's happening. Um, if you see that the soil is pulling away from the side, that can happen as the pot dries out. Um, you can you can top dress with a little bit of potting soil and um, you know break up that crust on top with your fingers and push some soil in around the edge. Um, okay, I put this um, water bottle. Say, let's imagine this is a plastic two liter pop bottle or water bottle. <laughs> and um, one strategy that I have seen some gardeners use, and especially like over the weekend if you want to be gone, is you can just take one of those pop bottles, fill it up with water, and poke like a small hole. And you might want to experiment like how fast you want this water to drip out of that pot bottle, but you can just set it into your pot until whoever's walking by your neighbors or something, if they're getting your mail, leave the pot bottle in my pot, in my pot. It's not, uh, it's not litter. <laughs> so anyway, that is one um, strategy that you can use. That's kind of a low tech, you know, almost free device. Um, and then you can go up from there with devices and um, things like that. Some I have seen there's like a cone that you can buy that screws onto the top of the water bottle. You punch holes, um, again, how fast do you want the water to come out? You punch holes in this cone, plastic cone, and then you screw the water, the liter bottle, the pot bottle full of water, you turn it over and you poke it into your soil. And so that will slowly leak, leak out into your pot and water it over, gives you, giving you a little more time. Okay. So um, again, I'm not really recommending specifically Rainbird, but it is a company that has a lot of drip parts. There are other companies out there, but um, this is just one example that can help you, you know, if you haven't installed a drip system before, it can be um, convenient to just get a kit and then you can put it in. You can also look at what are the parts on the kit and then just purchase those parts separately. Usually there's some advantage to a kit and some of the kits come with a timer which I think is um, I would recommend I research timers on um, the internet for sale and there's quite a range you can spend you know um, from the twist timers which maybe I don't know around twenty dollars right now a hand twist timer that's when you have to turn the water on and twist it on and then it clocks down that's a mechanical one but some of the electronic timers um, you can control from your phone. I saw a $50 one on Amazon about a year ago, and that one had an app that you could see from your phone how much you were watering and you could set it. And so they go up from there and you can spend you know, a few hundred dollars and have more controls, smart, smart watering. 
Okay, so let's talk about flowers. This is my favorite. <laughs> um, when you're doing flower pots, when you're um, you know planting flowers in your pots, you're going to want to think a little bit more about design, possibly than just if you're going to put a tomato in a bucket, for example, which might be a little more utilitarian. Um, you want to think about the size that plant wants to get to, and and certainly it's fine to to not let plants get to their full size, but um, but you want to think about that a big plant. You want to give it a bigger pot. Right? Um, texture refers to the leaf size. So a large textured plant, um, or like in this photo, the tulip has a large leaf, and so that's a large texture. And then the sweet alyssum that's kind of spilling out over the side that has a fine texture. So that's something you can think about in your design. Obviously, color. What colors do you want? You know, colors that go together um, or contrast nicely. Um, and you can use flowers and hanging baskets or pots. Um, the main design um, recommendation is that you put in a central plant and then you might put in some, some filler complementary secondary plants and then a spiller um, that's gonna cascade over the side. I think um, plants that bloom you know, all season long, such as geraniums work really well. Um, but you can also, you know, the tulips will bloom in the spring and then you can put something else in if you want to take those bulbs out and, and do something else. Um, one cool thing you could do with tulips, you plant them in the fall, but you can take a big pot or however big of a pot you have and you can do layers of tulips. And then in the spring, you can get that successive bloom just in tulips because the ones that are closest to the top will come up and bloom first. And then those other ones that are fighting from the bottom will do the same thing. So um, if you can do three layers of tulip, tulips, that will give you a little bit longer, longer bloom time. Oops, okay, skip this one. So this is coleus. Um, I, it's just one of my favorite plants, but it's not really a flower, but it can be used in, um, in flower um, containers because it just, Contrast really well. It comes in a whole bunch of different colors and variegations. And I'm um, sorry, really, that's not. Um, but here is a short list of flowers. There's many, many more. Um, you can organize your flowers or your vegetables around a theme. So if you want to do a pollinator um, garden in a pot um, or attract butterflies, you could do a milkweed with some other um, pollinator plants in there as well. So, you know, the sky's kind of the limit. Um, as far as, as that goes, but picking a theme is kind of a fun thing to do. Um, I grew sweet potato vines for the last first time last year, and that was really fun. And they were really beautiful um, until, yeah, until it froze um, in the fall. So they really liked that October, you know, we had that warm October. Okay, here's another fun little chat prompt. If you want, you could type in your favorite container plant that's not on the list. So I'll leave the list up for a minute. We could see if there's another one. Um, basil's not on the list. That might be one of your favorite ones. Um, I've had success growing that in containers. Um, that's a fun one. So I'll just see if people want to post some stuff in the chat. Oh, good. Um, Jody's posting it. Oh, Lantana. Yes, I love Lantana. I just thought it would also be fun for everyone in the class to see what other people like. That. that would be fun. Miracles, yeah. <laughs> I don't know that one. Okay. Well, hopefully everyone's had a chance to read the list. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep looking through. I just have a few more slides. Um, so I wanted to give you a slide on petunias because there's some new um, trademark, registered trademark <laughs> petunias out there. Um, but the cool thing about them is somehow they don't have to be deadheaded. And so the regular petunias, which we could now call, I guess, the old fashioned petunias from, you know, 10 years ago or whatever, however long um, ago, before super petunias and before the wave type petunias, um, those ones do need to be deadheaded or they get kind of ugly um, if you're going for, you know, aesthetics. Um, and you can check the different varieties. Um, the super tunias, because they're registered, um, you can't get the seeds. You just have to buy the plugs or the, the plants, you know, that have been started with 
the tag at the nursery. But the wave type ones now, I think that trademark um, has gone on long enough that you can get seeds for those. And then for sure for regular petunias, you can too. And I mean, I still like regular petunias, but um, but yeah, and I, I think it is a little therapeutic to have the deadhead if that or so. It's so fast. Okay. So now for our little design activity, I think yes, we are doing okay on time, I think, unless you guys want to go to QA, but I'll just give you this slide and then and then we can decide. But so I thought it would be good for you to, if you wanted to list the plants that you would like to grow, if it's vegetables or flowers, um, what are the specific ones that you're kind of thinking of? I I I kind of have some in mind when I'm looking at my pots. Um, I'll give you an example. And I could have put a photo in here and I should have, but I like to do um, red, white, and blue plants for 4th of July. So if I can get those planted in time, then by 4th of July, I have these red, white, and blue. So I'll do like like a red geranium in the middle or um, a white geranium with red petunias around. And then as blue as I can get it, the blue lobelia. Um, so that's just an example. Or if you wanted to do you know, a pot, like say this one was maybe a 16 inch pot, you probably could get five lettuce plants in there that would grow up. Um, and so that this one might be, you know, kind of a lettuce example. So you can just take out some paper, um, draw a big circle for your pot and you can draw as many circles as you want. Maybe you have a corner of the deck where you're gonna do three pots. Um, plants and pots in threes is a really nice design um, concept. Um, and so you can see in, in this one too, it's an odd number. So odd numbers are kind of more pleasing to the eye. Unless you're doing something symmetrical, then you might want four, two on two, so, you know, two on each side. So those are just a couple design ideas um, to think about. And then as you're drawing this too, say these ones on the outside were lettuce, you might want to um, put something tall in the middle. Uh, maybe a kale plant, you know, could grow up taller, um, a little bit taller than your lettuces. And then as you're harvesting your kale, you know, from the bottom, the lettuce plants might kind of cover up um, that kale leg. <laughs> so, um, so that's something that I can leave you with. And then, um, you know, you can do it right now while we're talking and then I'll, I'll go to the next slide, which is the Q&A slide. So um, Elizabeth, is it okay if I address these questions from, from before that I, you guys emailed me? Yeah, go ahead, Iris, yeah. That's okay. Cool. So I tried to poke in some answers here really quickly, but um, I don't really recommend upside down tomatoes. I did a little bit of reading and it is kind of an interesting idea. I do know some people in Moscow who have grown upside down tomatoes. They really like it, but um, but it can cause the plants to, I mean, they're gonna try to go up anyways. Um, and so they're having to do that work of going, you know, of curving and going up. And so they're putting energy into that maybe instead of making tomatoes. Um, that's one idea, but if you want to try it, I go forth. I <laughs> um, and uh, lavender in containers, yes, that can work. I think there were some examples of people who had um, tried that, and I think you just want to watch it for water and fertilizer. You just make those observations and see if you think it needs something. Um, yep, yeah. and then the herbs. I think it's the same um, soil. You know, just fertilizing as you need to. Um, and how do you know? How do you know if you're not getting enough fertilizer? Um, I guess the more you're watering, the more fertilizer you're going to need to give the plants, but you don't want to give too much water or too much fertilizer. So um, you'll just have to see, you know, if your plants look healthy, you know, you're doing a good job. If they don't look healthy, you know, you can try to adjust something. Um, I, um, I think chicken wire or hardware cloth, depending on what you're talking about. I mean, I, I think in a container, it's safer from um, squirrels or bulls or, or whatever, but um, I had success with cayenne pepper spray um, when I had squirrels that were eating my sunflowers and the cayenne pepper spray worked for that. Um, but there's probably some other products out there as well. Um, so this question about, um, it, we're about five down here regarding the problem of pots becoming dry and resistant to absorbing water. Um, I have not ever heard of using a surficant, but um, so that would be like a dish soap or something like that. And that might work. Um, I think if you can keep the soil moist, it shouldn't, it shouldn't, um, 
phosphate. That that usually happens after a soil has been dry. So if like you stored a pot with the soil in it, it might kind of cake over or become resistant. But um, one solution for that would be to wet your potting soil before you put it in the pot. So when we start seeds, um, you do want to moisten the soil because of that um, resistance to water. So um, if the pots, if the soil is already in the pot and you've got it planted, um, if you can use a tool or your fingers to break it up, that can help. If it's that caking over, if it's if it's just that resistance, eventually it will succumb to watering. <laughs> it will soak up the water. Um, okay, so worm casting. So um, I meant to mention with the vermicomposting, you can add it simply as the worm castings to and mix it in before you plant your pot, but also. You can take a couple tablespoons of your vermicompost, put it into a jar and shake it and turn that into a liquid fertilizer that you pour on. And so that can move that nutrition and, and the beneficial bacteria around a little bit more if you um, shake it into water. And then you can also stretch your vermicompost. If you're purchasing vermicompost, it can be pretty expensive. So that's a good reason for having a worm bin um, at your own house. So. Uh, best tips for starting seeds indoors and transplanting. Um, hmm. uh, well, um, having a sunny window or lights is a good thing. Um, if you have your plants up against a window, the windows can be cold, so having heat mats can really help. Um, and then I think um, we get a little bit of cabin fever in the winter, and so like I always want to start seeds in January or February, but then. If you think about it, you have to take care of those plants for five or six months. So um, now I'm always trying to wait until after the spring break. <laughs> and then at the middle school, we were starting seeds at that time. And then, you know, the kids go on spring break and the plants were getting watered. So sometimes we'd have to restart anyways. So, um, so yeah, waiting and or looking at your seed packets and working back from there. They usually give you the time of when you're going to, um, you know, when you're going to plant outdoors and it's six weeks back from there. So um, for some plants, we say around Mother's Day that you can plant outside, but we know it frosts after that. So um, anywhere between Mother's Day and June 15th, you should be able to plant outside. Um, does do, do strong winds play a role on vegetable growth? Um, yeah, and I think if you have the containers, you need to, you know, I didn't mention that, but this is a really good question because you need to put the containers in a sunny spot and kind of protected from the wind. Um, and so if they're close to your home, you know, they're gonna have a little more protection that way. Um, but sometimes, you know, especially like if they're on the north side, you're gonna wanna move them out a little bit further so they can get more sun because the north side is gonna be shady. So thinking about the location of where your pots are gonna go may determine what you put in them. So if you are planting on the north side or you have like, say you have a deck on the north side and you want some plants in containers, you could do some of the shade plants like hostas or or something like that. Um, so yeah, I would try not to put the pots um, in the wind, but if the plants grow up from seed in the wind, they'll get used to it, I think. Um, okay, and then um, deterrence for earwigs or other beneficial plantings that deter pests. So the marigolds are gonna help deter pests. Um, I um, was reading a bug guide that was prepared by a student and um, learned that earwigs are actually considered a beneficial bug because they eat some of the bad bugs. But I guess I was curious to know if you saw the earwigs were eating um, the plants, um, then in that case, you might want to use um, an insecticidal soap or something like that. But the problem with the um, any insecticide, whether it's just a spray of water or spray of soap are going to affect the beneficial bugs. So yeah, if the person who wanted to ask about earwigs or if anybody else has observed the earwigs doing the damage, sometimes we see like a bug and it's a beneficial, but we think it's a bad bug. So that could be the case as well. So, okay. So um, the, that was a lot of Q and A. <laughs> um, Oh, okay. The marigolds are getting eaten by the immature earwigs. Okay, yes. Um, I could see I could see that happening. Um, is there anyone selling vermicompost? I don't know of anyone um, 
selling vermicompost like from the farm, but I have seen it at some of the hardware stores. So there's definitely vermicompost for sale that way. And Iris, thank you for addressing all these questions. These were all sourced um, from folks registering. Um, we did have a few other questions um, that have kind of come in, not in the main chat. Um, uh, looks if we have just a few minutes left. Um, a, a further question about starting bulbs, spring bulbs in pots. So you had talked about that, um, but when when would be a good time for for doing that? Um, I think you know before it freezes, um, and then I would say, um, I would have the pot in a dry location. So I would have the soil be moist, but not have it be out where it's going to get all the rain and the snow. So um, the bulbs do want that cold weather. They do need to be um, have a cold period so that they can do their thing in the spring. Um, and so wherever that is at your place, you know, like my garage gets down to refrigerator temperature, so that would be a good place for me to bring those in if I wanted to plant bulbs in, in the pots. Mm -hmm. And then you can also buy, um, you could buy the bulbs that have been grown by the nursery and plant those bulbs into the pot because those have been vernalized, those have been, you know, have that cold period. And so, um, but if you're going to plant from bulb, then you need to do that in the, in the fall. You could also, um, you could probably put the bulbs, you know, you could learn more about this. I would say, don't just go on what I'm saying now, but you could put the bulbs in the refrigerator. They would get that cold period. And then in the spring, you could plant your pot. Um, whenever the snow, I'm looking at my watch, whenever the snow stops, <laughs> but your, your pots might be thawed out by now, or you could, you could plant, you know, pots right now. Um, if you're buying unfrozen potting soil. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> nice. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then another one, do you have any recommendations to help hanging pots from drying out? Yeah. So um, I showed the container pot kit, but there is, um, Rainbird has a drip kit. And so um, I have used the drip kit with a timer and I have the timer set to water twice a day. And so just for like, you know, 10 minutes um, twice a day. And then when it gets really hot and if I feel that the pots are drying out, the hanging baskets, then I will um, have, I will ex extend the time. But um, yeah, because they just can really dry out those um, coca core, um, coconut core uh, mat pots they just they hardly hold water and so um, one of the strategies that that we used um, for the hanging basket class was to put a plastic liner you can still poke a couple drain holes in it so it doesn't get too um, too wet but um, yeah those those hanging baskets can dry out the plastic ones are a little bit better and then if you can do those spillers that come around and kind of cover it you don't see the plastic pot as much but that is a challenge is keeping them well watered. There are some of those self-watering ones that have the tray attached, so it'll hold a little bit of water, and then that water can wick back up. So those are some of the strategies that I know. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and another question here, um, deterrence for stink bugs on tomatoes. Do you have any recommendations? Um, I don't know what the deterrent would be, but I definitely think you should hand pick your plants, um, you know, look for those bugs and, and, and pick them off. Um, I've been finding stink bugs inside this year and it's just so frustrating because they, you know, they're eating the plants inside and then they're just like, why are they here? <laughs> and <it's>, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And so then you, you want to dispose of them in a way where they're not going to release that stink, you know, if they are inside, but outside, um, you know, I mean, I hate to be uncompassionate, but you know, um, picking them off and destroying them is, is the best. Yeah. yeah. Vern has the recommendation here to give them to your chickens. So that's, oh, you know. yeah, that's <laughs> finish the cycle. Yeah. 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 That seems like, uh, yes, that's great. And then our, our final question on here um, was um, your involvement with veterans and how do folks get more info on your program with veterans? Oh, okay. Yeah. 
So um, this is exciting timing. Tomorrow is the first meeting of the, um, I'm going to go to my more beautiful slide here, um, the Farmer Veteran Coalition. And so um, if you can email me like tonight, that meeting is at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. And so we're just now starting the Idaho Farmer Veteran Coalition. The Farmer Veteran Coalition is a national organization um, and on the, you know, on the um, the Whitman County side and up in Spokane, you guys have had um, Vets on the Farm, which is an amazing program. And so we tried to learn as much as we could from the Spokane Conservation District and try to do what we can in Idaho. And so, um, so yeah, so that's going to be starting. And then um, one thing that we found was that we had a pretty small number of veterans who are interested in farming. And so we're going to go to more of this networking model. And um, and then any veterans can come to any of my classes. I will do a seed starting class just for veterans um, a little bit later in the spring. Um, so I can share that with, with you. If you email me, I can put you on my list. I have a list just for veterans um, who are interested in farming and gardening. Um, and then the recovery center has a veteran coordinator. So if you know of any vets who are in recovery, um, I'm starting to work with the recovery center and doing some gardening activities too for veterans and for people in recovery. So yeah, so um, I hope that I hope that's enough information on veterans, but I feel like like, yeah, let's let's connect and um, there's lots of resources out there. And then um, I don't know totally what's going on in Whitman County, but there has been some support in Whitman County of vets on the farm program over there. So. Awesome. Thank you. Um, well, yeah, we're just a little over seven o'clock here. Um, oh, yeah. I, yeah. Iris, thank you so much for sharing this wealth of information. Um, uh, if you have not seen Iris and her talks before, um, she's been doing a lot of talks with the University of Idaho Farm and Garden Series. Um, so, and there's there's a wealth of, of resources through the University of Idaho Extension, Horticulture, and Small Acreage. Um, uh, website. I would encourage you all to go check that out um, and ask more questions. And Iris has graciously shared her um, her email. So if you have specific questions, you can go talk to her. So Iris, thank you so much for your time and expertise tonight. Thank you.